Welcome to the Australian Business Executive Podcast, where we speak with Australia's most influential industry professionals on the business and economic development issues taking place across the country. You can stay up to date with all our content, including our magazines, podcasts and videos by visiting www.theabe.com.au and clicking on subscribe. Today's guest is Chris Wren. Chris was appointed to the role of Chief Executive of the Royal Institute of Deaf and Blind Children in 2010. Chris has worked in the health sector for 25 years, beginning his career as a registered nurse, subsequently working across a number of public, private and non-for-profit hospital and health management roles. He was General Manager of Sydney Cochlear Implant Centre prior to commencing his role as Chief Executive of Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children. Chris holds a Bachelor of Applied Science and a Bachelor of Business with combined majors in marketing and accounting. He completed strategic perspectives in non-for-profit management at Harvard University under scholarship from the Harvard Club of Australia and is a Harvard Club Australia non-profit fellow. Chris, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Stuart. So for our listeners who may not be familiar with the Royal Institute of Death and Blind Children, could you explain a little bit about what the organisation do? Sure. So the Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children, despite its name, is actually an all-of-life service, particularly for those with hearing loss. So we're a complex service organisation that covers education, health and disability services for people with hearing and vision loss. We support about 8,000 people across the country. Whilst our head office is in New South Wales, we provide services in every state and territory in either a physical form or we actually provide services through telepractice or outreach um, and partnership arrangements. So we do everything from uh, working with uh, diagnostic services through um, uh, early intervention activities for children. We support kids in regular schools, but we run schools and we run preschools. We have Australia's largest cochlear implant program, the Sydney Cochlear Implant Centre. And uh, we also have the RIWC Rennick Centre, which is our professional development arm, which trains professionals of the future who are working with people with hearing and vision loss. The organisation has engaged a new strategic plan. Can you tell us a bit about this? Sure. So there are three main focuses to that strategic plan. The first um, is really about impact on mission, about reaching more people with hearing and vision loss uh, in Australia. And so if I use as an example hearing loss, Hearing loss is a highly treatable condition in Australia, particularly in elderly Australians, but we're not seeing enough people step up and actually get the treatment that they need. And so one of our big focuses in our expansion across Australia is making sure that we align services with community need where people with hearing and vision loss reside. So the first is is, uh, meeting nationwide demand for services in the hearing and the vision space and we're doing that through building new infrastructure, we're building that through acquiring and partnering with other organisations and we're doing it through technology. The second uh, part of our strategic intent is about building centres of excellence and a relocation to Macquarie University precinct where the Australian Hearing Hub exists. And that's really about uh, working with other organisations to continue the very, very high standard of expertise, both at a research level, a professional development level, a service level, um, a training level, to uh, discern and demonstrate world-leading best practice in hearing and vision loss. And what we expect to achieve through these centres of excellence in hearing loss and vision is we can take out to the field key learnings from those centres of excellence to influence how we operate in a geographically dispersed model. Um, We also recognise that we have two head offices. We have the Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children's head office, which is in North Rocks and Sydney at presently, and the Sydney Cochlear Implant Centre's head office, which we acquired in 2014, and we'll be relocating and building those as one head office function at Macquarie University. And the third part of our strategic plan is really about sustainability and awareness. We need to make sure that in a new environment that people understand who we are and the services we provide, and that captures everything from how we promote our service to our brand that we use, but also how we make sure that we use money as far and wide uh, as possible. And so being an efficient organisation, being accountable for the money that we spend, making sure that it delivers great impact and great value to those people who invest money with us to provide a community service is really important. So that last piece is really about sustainability and awareness of the organisation which I work. What does the NDIS mean to your dealings as an organisation? 
Yeah, so I think the NDIS is a very uh, big change in the sector. So I think at the simplest level, we recognise that organisations like ours, which have been reliant on block funding, as in large amounts of money from the government that are given to the service provider, is now making way for client-centred uh, funding, which means that the users of services will now receive an allocated package of which they then go shopping, if you like, to look at the service provider that best aligns with their need. And RODBC is very pro-choice, so the idea that consumers are all discerning about where they get their support uh, makes a lot of sense. I think the biggest challenge, though, is for those organisations that are almost wholly reliant on that uh, historical block funding, they are very vulnerable in a client-centred funding model because their funding is removed and they have to compete in, the, in an open market sense to attract clients into their, their care. And so I think for small based operators where they do one or two uh, uh, things, they'll be fine under an NDIS and, and uh, working with the agency in that regard. I think the very large providers like RODBC will put in place the infrastructure to uh, work with the government to market our services and to administer, if you like, the NDIS. But the, the medium-sized ones are really struggling. So specifically, you asked the question, what does it mean for RODBC? It means a change in the way that we actually position ourselves in the marketplace. We recognise that clients will uh, have a whole heap of new providers come into the marketplace and offer uh, important services to them. I guess the question in there is, are they those new service providers going to be able to provide the depth of service that traditional players like RODBC have provided? And that's a, a bit of a risk play for a consumer. So our job is to respond, and, and our response isn't just to make people more aware of what we do, but we are now much more agile in the community. So we've relocated a lot of our core services out into the communities where need exists uh, because we recognise that today... When people are given the choice of convenience or quality, people generally choose convenience uh, and our job is to make sure that they have a quality service provider that is convenient or accessible to them. So for us, uh, our strategy well aligns with changes in funding in the NDIS. We are, as an organisation, have a very diverse uh, set of funding uh, to us, which means that we're not wholly reliant on NDIS revenue to do what we do. But I think for the sector it creates a lot of challenges, particularly those organisations where they are almost wholly reliant on government funding and block funding to exist. You've previously commented that the NFP space sometimes suffers from second-class leadership compared to profit-driven organisations. Could you expand on this? Sure. So I think the question is really about making sure that the NFP is more accountable for its spending of money because it's trusted to them. I mean, um, whether it be come from government or be it community support or corporate Australia supporting, the NFP sector actually, as custodians of money, have to make sure that we are highly accountable for it. But the conundrum is that quite often the NFP sector pays significantly lower than the corporate sector. And so uh, the challenge in there is how do you attract high calibre uh, uh, leadership staff into a not-for-profit area to ensure that uh, you know the best type of leadership exists in those organisations to create impact on mission and sustainability. And sustainability is obviously all key in this field. I think it's a real challenge. There are many different professionals who are attracted into the, the not-for-profit space uh, for many different reasons. I think we have a higher bar, if you like, of accountability. And, I, and my concern is making sure that NFPs are well served through very high calibre executives, but recognise those high calibre executives may not actually get corporate commensurate pay. So therein lies the challenge. We would say, uh, and my view in the Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children is to make sure that we attract the very best calibre of applicants, irrespective of what sector they come from. But that does require, if you like, you to be competitive in the remuneration for them. Um, but again, to, to summarise my answer to that question, I think the most important issue is that you have high calibre leadership because we have to be more accountable for the use of our dollars than, say, corporate Australia, where you can make decisions, if you like, in regard to spending in, in, in a variety of different directions that may or may not align exactly with the business needs. In, an effort, in a not-for-profit environment, impact on mission and making sure you use your money uh, sustainably, but also to create maximum impact in regard to your cause is, is all critical. Since you've come into the CEO role in 2010, you must have seen a lot of changes. How have the changes in technology affected the lives of the people you assist? 
Yeah, so while I think everyone in society will benefit from changes in technology and easier ways of doing things, I think the disability sector is probably where we've seen the biggest impact. So at the lightest level, things like tablet technologies are really game changers for people with disability, particularly people with hearing and vision loss. So I'll use an example. Your, your iPhone or your um, smartphone has inbuilt satellite navigation. Now that for a person who is of low vision or blind, that is an absolute godsend because they can find themselves in uh, traversing into environments they previously would never. So a person who is blind traditionally is quite concerned about getting lost or being in unfamiliar areas, but with smartphone technology and personal satellite navigation, uh, the risk of that is actually mitigated. There's also a range of apps these days that will help people with low vision or blind. I mean, from everything from currency um, uh, creators that tell you exactly what currency you're holding in your hand through to telling you whether you've left lights on at night before you go to bed, right through to whether your tie matches your shirt, something I struggle with on a daily basis uh, and I'm fully sighted. For a person with hearing loss, the fact that um, uh, it will convert a speech to text and text to speech, these are absolutely fantastic things that are inbuilt to a lot of technologies. Equally, things like the cochlear implant has really opened up a whole range of different outcomes for people with um, uh, significant hearing loss. So while RADBC has been around for 157 years, we've worked very hard to make sure that uh, deaf people communicate and traditionally that's come through Auslan. Today, as a result of technology like high-powered hearing aids and cochlear implants, we recognise with uh, newborn screening and early detection of uh, hearing loss, we can get a child to age-appropriate speech and language by school age and they can be fully integrated into a mainstream school. Um, the other aspects that um, uh, are all compelling is the opportunity for um, ocular implants of the future. Whilst that will only support a very limited amount of people with vision loss because most vision loss is a result of a cortical uh, challenge area, we think that those things are exciting prospects for the future. So I'd have to say technology is making a big difference. One of the other areas that we're really um, excelling in is telepractice. So there aren't many things that we can't do across an internet connection now. We can do everything from assess um, and uh, program a cochlear implant through to deliver braille services and uh, early education programs and intervention services all through telepractice blog sites that connect uh, communities that might be remote and rural uh, in nature. We can really create um, a wonderful sense of virtual community now to support children with hearing or vision loss or adults who rely on RIDBC services. So very exciting um, developments in the telepractice space. Well, Chris, that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. No, it's a pleasure, Stuart. It's been great to be able to talk to you. This has been a production of the Australian Business Executive, a division of Romulus Rising Proprietary Limited, all rights reserved. You can stay up to date with the Australian Business Executive, including our magazines, podcasts and videos by visiting www.theabe.com.au and clicking on subscribe.